You had an option, sir. You could have said, I am not going to do it. This is wrong for Canada. You're listening to Oh Brother, When Art Thou? And now here's your host, Neil White. Welcome to Oh Brother, When Art Thou? I'm your host, Neil White, joined as always by my brother, David. And it is a bright, beautiful, sunny day where I am. David, how about where you are? Well, sunny at least. We could use a little bit more warmth for the middle of May. Yeah, rather cold spring this year. I don't know if that has something to do with the pandemic. I feel like Mother Nature is just trying to keep us all inside, keeping it cold and wet and rainy here at least this spring. It has been a cold spring. I suppose you're better at seeing the bright side of it than I am. Well, we'll enjoy the sunny days while we can, David. And when it's raining out, we'll listen to a podcast like this one. I'll ask you the question, David. Oh, brother, when art thou? Neil, it's April 25th, 1974, at the Presidential Palace in Lisbon, Portugal. A guard watches as a column advances on the door. There are troops advancing, members of the coup, which has been going on by this point for hours. But more than that, there are ordinary people, civilians, dancing in the streets with sheer joy at the fact that finally someone is standing up to the regime. The guard continues to wait. A momentous decision is on his shoulders. Does he open fire? Try and prevent the crowd from making their way into the palace? One last desperate hope of holding out for long enough for some possible loyal forces to show up to save the regime? Or does he decide to retire, walk out, and join the crowd? Another happy revolutionary on this exciting, energized day. He notices in the barrels of the guns of the soldiers advancing with this column. They've placed carnations as a recognition symbol for who is working for the revolution. And as he stands there, amazingly, one of the women with the column, walking alone, walks up to the door and offers him a tangible representation of his choice. She stretches out her hand with a carnation offering it to him. Does he join her, or does he open fire? A big question for the protesters and the government, for everyone involved. Will the Guard join the revolution? David, take us back to 1974. What is going on? Why is there a coup against the regime? So, 1974 in Portugal... Portugal is ruled by a dictatorship, calling itself the Estada Novo, the New State, which has become kind of an ironic name since they formally named themselves that in 1933. They're the one of only two remaining fascist or allegedly fascist right-wing dictatorships in Europe at this point, Spain being the other one. And fundamentally, the sheer fact that they don't provide the citizens with the political freedoms that their neighbors in any other country in Western Europe can enjoy has already takes a heavy toll on the regime's legitimacy in the eyes of the population. But by 1974, they're facing two serious crises that are making that unpopularity of the regime much, much worse. The first of those two crises is economic. Portugal is a basket case. They just do not have very many effective export industries. Their tourism industry is has long been crippled at this point by their international pariah status as a dictatorship in Western Europe, and their internal economy is in no way sufficient to support their population. So that's their first crisis. But their second, in some ways, 
even worse crisis is the ongoing wars that they are fighting in no less than four separate African colonies, all of which are seeing uprisings by the population struggling to be free, because by 1974, most of Africa, formerly colonized by European powers, has been released to freedom, and Portugal is a bizarre outlier by trying to hold on to these countries. Are the two crises related, David? Is there a need to keep the colonies to make up for the economic problems in Portugal? Honestly, it's more the other way around. The economic crisis in Portugal has deep roots, but one of the additional factors that has been weighing on the Portuguese economy, slowing it down, is the expense of holding on to African colonies, which fundamentally, so long as the revolutions are going on, and by this point, some of these revolutions have been going on for decades, these African economies are not particularly productive at the best of times. And with uprisings among the population, they're a net loss for the Portuguese economy which it is struggling to keep paying for. So now, along with revolutions in the colonies, there is a revolution in Portugal itself. How does this come about, David? So the key group we have to discuss here is the Armed Forces Movement. This is a group of junior officers. Famously, it's led by captains. Junior officers in the Portuguese army who are discontented with the regime on a number of different levels. First, as ordinary citizens of Portugal, they're discontented with the regime for all of the economic reasons that it is unpopular with pretty much everybody. But then, as officers in the Portuguese military, they feel that the Military operations in Africa have been mismanaged, have had heavier casualties than necessary, and that they're risking their lives for nothing. They don't feel the connection to the African colonies that possibly is more ingrained in an older generation that can remember a more colonialist time before World War II broke out. And finally, They have another grievance against the government because in the midst of the ongoing wars, the government, incredibly, is conducting a plan to conduct major cuts in their military expenses, including salary cuts for soldiers and plans to integrate the reserves and regular units more closely because the government feels that reserve officers are cheaper to pay than full-time regular officers, but for officers in the regular army, many of them feel that that will merely cut back their chances of promotion and continuing career progress. So they feel that they're being hard done by by a government that has been putting them in harm's way for nothing for years. Seems like they have some legitimate concerns, David. It wouldn't seem smart to me to cut your military budget in the middle of a war. But of course, there's also the economic crisis. It's a bit of a mess. It's a lot of a mess. And to be fair to the Portuguese government, not that they deserve it, the economic crisis was a long time coming. The military crisis that they have ongoing is not as perhaps as bleak as it might seem. Casualties are fairly low simply because the African guerrillas are very poorly armed. And unlike some colonial wars where the Soviet Union really got involved in shipping weaponry to the rebels for geostrategic reasons, Portugal's colonies have not attracted that kind of outside intervention 
frankly, no one really cares about Portugal or its colonies in Africa. So it's a much lower intensity kind of conflict than we usually think of when we hear the term war. But ultimately, it's too much. It's been too much for a long time. And this group has come together slowly, communicated with each other, and realized that they want to rise up. They want to overthrow the government and install their own new system. Does this bring us to April 25th, 1974, David? And the big choice to be made by our young guard outside the government headquarters? It does, but I want to just have one short diversion away from that critical moment. Oh, you're going to make me wait for the answer. Have you ever heard of Eurovision, Neil? I believe it's a reality TV show. Yes, it's a song contest where various countries from around Europe introduce songs and then people at home can vote on which country has the best song. I know it's very popular. So in 1974, Portugal was a member of the Eurovision Song Contest brought a song to that contest, as you would expect, and came dead last. That may not seem very important, but on the 25th of April, 1974, in the early hours of the morning, the heavily armed troops of this coup weighed in to determine whether they were ready to go ahead and seize the critical facilities in Lisbon and overthrow the government were listening for a song on the radio because they had a contact inside the radio station another sympathizer working with them who was using his job as a reporter to find out what was going on and if the government had been tipped off about the plan and if he determined that everything was clear his orders were In the early morning, he had to play the Eurovision song entry from Portugal from that year. And they'd chosen that song because censorship on the radio station was very strict and they couldn't afford to have him play a song that wouldn't pass the censors and attract attention and possibly have him spill these beans and tell about this entire plan but they also had to pick a song that no ordinary DJ would just play in an ordinary morning set list because then they might not send the right signal. They also had a song to play in the event that there was a problem to tell everybody not to go ahead and launch the attacks. So he played the Eurovision song, the coup went ahead, and that's the entirety of the diversion. I'm going to go back to the moment with the guard now. So I guess it wasn't a very good song. If it came dead last in Eurovision, David, the soldiers hear the song and they rise up, not because it's a bad song, but because it's the signal to overthrow the government, bringing us back to the presidential palace and the decision of a guard facing down the uprising in the streets of Lisbon. And I'll just stop and note again here. The planners of the coup had not anticipated that the people would rise up when the coup began. In point of fact, early on in the coup, as they had taken over the radio and TV station and were doing announcements to the population, they merely asked people to stay in their homes and stay safe. But that didn't happen, obviously. People spontaneously came out on the streets, and one of those people was a young lady by the name of Celeste Cairo. And she would have an important influence on this moment because she worked for a restaurant in Lisbon that had been planning a giveaway that day for their customers, something nice to get people in the doors. They'd been planning to give everyone who came in a carnation. But as you can imagine, when the owners heard that there was a revolution on in Lisbon, they shut down. They didn't want anyone to go into work and get shot. And so Celeste ended up with all of the carnations, which she had gotten the day before to bring into work, to hand out to people for free, and nothing to do with them because 
they weren't going to last that long, which is how the carnation started. She started giving it to the soldiers in the streets and it became a recognition symbol for the soldiers and a symbol of the revolution. And they were putting them in the barrels of guns in the barrels of guns that were on tanks, wearing them in people's hair all over the place. And so that brings us back to this guard who has the choice. Take the carnation, join the revolution, or refuse it, open fire, and start a bloodbath on the streets of Lisbon. What a great coincidence, David, that she happened to have some extra carnations, which became the symbol of this revolution. Pretty good symbol, to be honest. But it kind of seems like you keep going on diversions because you're never going to tell me the answer to the question of what the soldier did. Just one more diversion. Oh my goodness. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Okay. He reaches out. He takes the carnation. The troops with him. They realize if people aren't going to fight, they're looking at each other. No one wants to open fire. The column is arriving at the doors. Suddenly, they open the doors and the people flood in. And the troops of the rebels flood in too. And suddenly everybody is grabbing carnations and dancing in the streets. And what had looked mere hours before like it was going to be a bloody battle in a vicious revolution coup d'etat is becoming instead a spontaneous dance party. The palace has fallen with only the force of carnations. Exactly. Something to be said for flower power, David. And indeed... The 25th of April, 1974, will become known in the history of Portugal as the Carnation Revolution. And it's a holiday in Portugal to this day. What's the fallout, David? What happens next? Well, a lot. A lot happens next. So, in 1974, they set up a provisional government to run the country. The first president of the provisional government is a senior army officer who wasn't involved in the coup, but whom the previous president dictator of Portugal had believed must be running the coup because they hated each other and he thought he was going to run a coup. So when he heard there was a coup going on, he was like, must be that guy. Well, I was hoping they would pick Celeste Quero, but I can understand that maybe a waitress who handed out carnations wouldn't be the best figurehead for the government. So the president, the dictator, announces he will only surrender to this general. This general parlays it into becoming president briefly, but then he doesn't have any contacts with the armed forces movement that actually overthrew the government because he really wasn't involved, it turns out. So that becomes a mess. In the end, the provisional government lasts two years until elections can be set up and in those two years there's no fewer than six provisional governments or presidents or however you want to divide up this constantly shifting unclearly organized political situation six different presidents six and in 1975 essentially the year that this provisional government is in power for There are no fewer than two attempted coups which are stopped, one by a right-wing group, one by a left-wing group who wish to introduce communism to Portugal, which ironically turns out to be the best thing that could have happened for the Portuguese government when the American government of Richard Nixon with Henry Kissinger as Secretary of State decides that there's a very real possibility that Portugal will fall to communism. This is the height of the Cold War. That has to be stopped. And to prevent that, he decides he's going to flood the country with American money for any group that wants to establish democracy, which helps to end the economic crisis that was ongoing, that was such a factor in the cause of this revolution. And so the situation remains chaotic. It gets more chaotic in November of 1975 
when Francisco Franco, the Spanish dictator, dies, and suddenly Portugal's closest neighbor, Spain, is also in a very chaotic transition in government. But it all works out, more or less, somehow. They keep the far right out of power, they keep the far left out of power, and in 1976, they have elections, the first elections in Portugal since 1926, 50 years before, and introduce the modern multi-party democracy to Portugal, which remains the governing system there today. What happens in the colonies, David? In Africa and also in East Timor, we'll get to it in a second, the provisional government, as one of its first, most unanimous actions, announces that they're conducting a unilateral withdrawal. They believe that the colonies should be free, and so they're pulling all troops and all Portuguese citizens who don't want to be there any longer out as soon as possible. And... In most of the African colonies, that goes fairly smoothly, more or less, which then leads into chaotic transitions of their own in each of these countries, which could easily be podcasts of their own. The craziest, in particular, happens in Angola, which immediately has military interventions placed within its borders by South Africa, under the apartheid government at the time, and Cuba under the communist government of Fidel Castro. I don't think I could explain why either of those forces are doing this in the amount of time we could possibly spend on it. So it's a chaotic situation, and the point is Portuguese forces are withdrawn. They are no longer colonizing power there. In East Timor, the other major Portuguese colony, which is in Asia. The Portuguese again withdraw in 1974, setting up a new independent government. But tragically, the government of Indonesia invades and annexes East Timor, leading to a long rebellion and a human rights disaster in its own right in that country. But you really can't blame the Portuguese for the fact that the Indonesian government decided to invade. And the only other Portuguese colony held at this time is Macau, a city in China. And that actually they hold on to for some reason. And it ends up becoming part of the same sort of deal as the British cut with the Chinese vis-a-vis Hong Kong. And it becomes a part of China in 1999. So I think that sums up most of the Portuguese overseas colonies. For this story, the real relevance is that the Portuguese withdraw from all of them as quickly as they can. So a bit of a mixed bag as to what happens afterwards, but at least the Europeans are getting out of the colonies. Exactly. And David, I'm sure the question that everyone really wants to know the answer to is... Do the Portuguese entries in Eurovision get better? I can't say I've researched it in any depth. They do have some better performances in terms of rankings. They have some songs that are not in dead last. So improvement. There are also, I actually happened to come across while researching this, a quote from a book on Eurovision song entries, which rather snarkily points out that it's hard to imagine any of Portugal's Eurovision Song Contest entries leading an uprising, and it's amazing that even one of them did. So I guess it's all a matter of personal taste. Well, David, a remarkable collision of flowers, bad music, and political uprisings all coming together in a rather unexpected way without major bloodshed in 1974 in Portugal. Indeed. If you like this story, make sure you go and leave us a rating wherever you listen to podcasts. It would really help us out and help others to find us. David, we always like to end with a quiz. Are you ready for a quiz? I could do a quiz, Neil. 
If you listened to last week's bonus episode on the 75th anniversary of Victory in Europe Day, the Battle and the Victory Day was the title of that podcast. If you haven't listened to it, you can go back and listen to it. It's free, available wherever you listen to podcasts. But at the end of it, we did play a game about code names and the code names of operations. So we're going to keep with that theme, David. Last time you were trying to guess where the battles or where the events of the code name took place. This time we've got some better known code names and I'm going to see if you remember what the operation was behind the code name. Ooh, even trickier, but you said better known code names, so I'll keep up some hope. And these are all from the Second World War, part of our Victory in Europe special. So that gives you a hint, narrows it down a little bit. For example, our first code name was Codename Ultra. That's interesting, since Ultra wasn't used to refer to a battle, but rather referred to a British code breaking operation which broke the encoded messages sent by the German's Enigma cipher machine. You've got it exactly. The signal's intelligence resulting from the German cipher system was ultra. One for one, David. Our next one is an American operation, codename Cornflakes. Codename Cornflakes. Wow, I've never heard of that one. I mostly just picked it because I thought it was a funny codename. I will guess that it had to do with the advance into Germany. Well, David, maybe they were thinking that people would be reading propaganda with their morning breakfast when they named Cornflakes. It was a program of insertion of propaganda into the German mail system. So I guess people picked up their mail and had their morning breakfast. That was Operation Cornflakes. Interesting. Our next one, David, Operation Barbarossa. Operation Barbarossa, the infamous codename used by the German army for their surprise invasion of Russia. You are absolutely right. It was the invasion of the Soviet Union. And if you're wondering where it came from, Redbeard was the nickname for Emperor Frederick I. Another fairly famous operation you might know, David, Mincemeat. Operation Mincemeat. That was a very interesting one, as I recall. I believe it was an operation conducted by British intelligence where they placed a dead body off of the coast of Spain with the intention that it would be found by the Spanish and given to the Germans together with some apparent intelligence which was not real but rather was intended to deceive the Germans about their intentions regarding the upcoming invasion of Sicily. You're correct, David. That is the entire operation. You pretty much explained it right there. A successful British deception operation during the Second World War between mincemeat and cornflakes. I'm starting to get hungry here. One last question for you, David. Operation Point Blank. Operation Point Blank. No relation to the 1980s movie, I assume. I don't think so. I don't know Operation Point Blank. This was a U.S. and U.K. operation. A joint operation by the two largest Western allies. I think they frequently collaborated on amphibious assaults. So I'm wondering if it was a amphibious invasion, possibly in Italy? Good guess, David, but this was actually an umbrella operation used for the bombing offensive in preparation for another code name you might know, Overlord. Ah. Of course, Overlord, David, was the Great Crusade. You can hear all about that one in episode 28, titled The Great Crusade. So go back and give a listen to that, our D-Day special. David, thanks for playing along. I always enjoy it, Neil. And thanks for listening. Let's go out with a little bit of Eurovision. So, Portugal now, and then... Não
Tu te desfolhei, tu te deste em amor. 